1977, the Apple II began it all. Highly versatile with its open architecture and expansion slots, it featured a multicolor display and a user-friendly programming language at a relatively affordable price. As the first model of a long-lasting line, it would become the first widely popular microcomputer and it would end up with an incredibly large software library. This same year, and for half the price, you could get the TRS-80 from Tandy Radio Shack. Easy to use and powerful, it was a good deal despite its monochrome low-res display. It had extension capabilities and a wide range of options. Its large commercial distribution network contributed to its success. About 400,000 units were produced, a record in the early years of personal computing. The third one of the original 1977 Trinity was the Commodore PET 2001, with its futuristic look and all-in-one case, which put together everything you needed. Its compact design and networking capabilities made it popular in schools, but its keyboard was definitely bad. Not as successful as the Apple or TRS, the PET was still a landmark in the history of home computers. As time went on, new manufacturers launched their computers. In the UK, the Acorn Atom was the ancestor of the BBC Computer Series. Its great advantage was a very low cost, less than $500, and high resolution capabilities as compared to its competitors within this price range, which was quite unusual in 1979. Very similar to the original Apple II, the Apple II Plus had 48K of base memory and included the AppleSoft basic programming language in ROM. It also had 50% more colors than the original model. An estimated 400,000 were sold until the next model, Apple IIe, much more than the 50,000 of the first model, and which also proves the computer industry was coming of age. The Texas Instruments TI-994 was the first 16-bit home computer, and its processor was a whopping 3 MHz. Its calculator-style keyboard and the lack of software were drawbacks, but it had groundbreaking 16-color graphics and sprite support in high-res mode. These stunning capabilities were only comparable with those of the Atari 400 released a month after. The Atari 400-800 offered impressive graphics and sound capabilities for a decent price. It had a wide range of software, including popular games like Asteroids, Missile Command, and Pitfall. The 400 was more affordable but had a membrane keyboard. The 800 had a conventional one and a second cartridge slot. The Atari 400-800 broke a new computer record, selling over 2 million units. And now we're entering the mighty 80s, a magical time for many of us who were kids back then and a landmark in the golden age of home computers. The Sinclair ZX80 marked a milestone in home computing. For less than £100 or $200, it was a very affordable DIY computer with 1K of RAM, built-in BASIC, and a monochrome display. The ZX80 helped make home computing more accessible and paved the way for the more popular ZX81 and ZX Spectrum. The Commodore VIC-20 was another computer at a friendly price, but ready to use, not being a kit. Even though it had limited capabilities with only 5K of RAM and was not known for its reliability, it brought early computing to many households and became popular for its large library of games and software, selling about 3 million units and paving the way for future Commodore computers. Okay, so I've also put here some computers that are more business-oriented than family. Since businesses can be large or small or even from home, the boundary between professional and personal is not always obvious. That's why you'll see a few such computers in this timeline. The Apple III initially aimed to succeed the Apple II. It offered improved processing power and business-focused features, but at $4,300 and beyond, it was much more expensive than the Apple II. If you add to that the lack of software compatibility and a number of hardware problems, it's easy to understand why this model completely failed commercially. The Commodore PET 4000 had several improvements over the original PET, which was then renamed PET 2001. It was improved in almost everything, overall design, keyboard, display, memory, and expansion possibilities. These changes made the PET 4000 more user-friendly and better suited for home and business needs. The 4000 sold about four times more than the first PET. The TRS-80 color computer was the first color Tandy machine, it was very affordable and became popular for games, educational software, and programming. 
It was followed by two subsequent models, and estimates suggest that hundreds of thousands were produced overall for the three different machines in this series. The TRS-80 Model 3 retained the same basic architecture as the Model 1, but reflected three years of technological advance, more powerful, sleeker design, and a larger display. Like the Commodore PET, it was an all-in-one computer with a built-in keyboard, and also became a popular choice for home users and small businesses selling about 300,000 units. One year after the ZX80, Sinclair released the ZX81. There was very little technical difference between the two computers. The most significant change was in the construction. The ZX81 was designed to be small, simple, and above all, inexpensive, with as few components as possible. It met a much larger international success, selling over 1.5 million units in many different countries. But 1981 would be foremost remembered for the IBM PC, also known as the 5150. It was designed primarily for business use and became the basis of the IBM PC compatible standard worldwide. The first model had 16K of RAM and no disk drives, but featured an open architecture for hardware and software. At $1,500, it sold very well, and its remarkable success laid the foundations for the modern PC industry. Two years after the TI-99-4, the TI-99-4A addressed the issues of its predecessor with a simplified design, a better keyboard, improved graphics, and a unique expansion system. At half the cost of the first model, sales picked up significantly, and over the next two years, TI entered a price war with Commodore and its VIC-20. By 1983, both machines had a ridiculous retail price of $100 and sold an equivalent overall amount of about 3 million units. The Acorn BBC Micro was used extensively in UK schools. It had a high-quality basic interpreter, a wide range of software, and good documentation. It was relatively expensive and had limited graphics and processing power, but it was reliable and easy to upgrade. The BBC Micro was still fondly remembered by a whole generation of UK students and teachers. The NEC PC-8801 was one of the first popular home computers in Japan during the 1980s. It was the first home computer to support kanji characters, which made it popular for business use. It was powered by the Zilog Z80 processor of 4 MHz, which was a tremendous speed in 1981. With a wide range of software available including games, productivity, and educational programs, the PC-8801 was a popular platform for games and software development in Japan. The Sinclair ZX Spectrum was the most popular home computer in the UK. Its name reflected the machine's color display, as opposed to the black and white of its predecessors, the ZX80 and 81. It had a 3.5 MHz Z80 processor, 16 or 48K of RAM, and a simple color graphics display. It was aimed at mainstream audiences. It was in the UK what the C64 was in the US, with its wide range of games and software. The Commodore 64 is listed in the world records as the highest selling single computer model of all time, with up to 17 million units sold. Its release price was $600, equivalent to $1,800 in 2022. The level of performance you could have for that price was without equivalent at the time. With 64K of RAM, 16 colors on screen, and a 4 voice custom sound chip, the C64 achieved superior visuals and audio compared to all other systems. Its floppy drive performance was awful, but that did not deter customers. The C64 and its gigantic software library dominated the low-end computer market for most of the 1980s. Designed by Tangerine Computer Systems, the Auric 1 was a cheap but capable home computer that offered good value for the money. At the equivalent of only $150, it was marketed as a low-cost alternative to the Spectrum and the C64 in Europe. It had 16 or 48K of RAM, 240 by 200 pixels in 8 colors, and a 3-channel sound chip. The Auric became popular in the UK and in France. Reviews of the time described the Dragon as a redesigned, less expensive TRS-80 color computer with 32K of RAM and a better keyboard, stating that it, quote, offers more features and the money than most of its British competitors, but there's nothing exceptional about it, end quote. The Dragon 64 had double the RAM. Despite initial success at its launch in 1982, the Dragon's graphical limitations restricted its appeal in the gaming and educational markets. In 1983, the Apple Lisa had an advanced graphical user interface with a mouse input, following the example of the Xerox Star two years before. Just imagine, one megabyte of RAM at a time when 64K was considered a luxury. While groundbreaking, the Lisa was much too expensive and its later competition from the Macintosh accelerated its downfall. One year before the Mac, the Lisa paved the way for future GUI-based systems. 
The Apple IIe featured several enhancements over its predecessor, including built-in lowercase letters, 80-column text mode, and a more powerful CPU, and a variety of expansion slots for adding peripherals and was sold with a variety of software. The Apple IIe was a popular machine for home and business use and one of the best-selling personal computers of all time, lasting a full 10 years of service. The Atari 600-800XL succeeded the original 400 and 800. They featured enhanced graphics and sound, more memory, and an improved keyboard design. The 600XL offered affordability and compatibility, while the 800XL provided expanded memory and performance. Despite its technical advance, the XL line faced market challenges due to the video game crash and competition from other computers. The 600XL and 800XL were $50 higher than the VIC-20 and C64, respectively. The Acorn Electron was an affordable alternative to the BBC Micro and was designed to compete with the ZX Spectrum. The Electron was popular among gaming enthusiasts due to its compatibility with a wide range of BBC Micro software. Despite its lower price point, it struggled to match the success of its big brother due to limited expandability and a lack of networking capabilities. Nonetheless, it remains a notable item of the 1980s microcomputer era. The IBM PC 5160, later known as the XT, was a landmark in the history of personal computing. Running on an Intel 8088 processor, it offered 128 to 640K of RAM and used not only floppy but also hard disk. A built-in 10 megabyte hard disk was groundbreaking for the time, enabling substantial data storage. The PC XT played a pivotal role in establishing IBM's dominance in the emerging personal computer market and set standards for future models. The Spectra Video SV318 was one year late. It could have become popular in 1982, but in 83, 16K of RAM and a membrane keyboard were serious drawbacks. The funny, integrated joystick was not enough to turn the tables, but its more powerful big brother, the SV328, was interesting in the sense that its technical features served as a basis for the MSX computer standard, although the Spectra Video itself was not fully MSX compatible. 1984 began with the spectacular launch of the Apple Macintosh, along with one of the most famous TV ads of all time, in which the world was saved from gray uniformity where everyone looked alike. The Macintosh was indeed different. It was the first personal computer targeting a wide market to come with a graphical user interface and a mouse. The Mac was expensive, but its innovative high-quality design, user-friendly interface, and a wide range of applications explain its success as the most legendary line of personal computers. The Sinclair QL was aimed at the serious home user in business markets. It had 128K of RAM, just like the Mac, which was more than enough back then, an even more powerful CPU, and a multitasking operating system. But the QL's microdrive cartridge storage system didn't appeal to software publishers, neither did its 8-bit architecture to professional businesses. Its high price, poorly designed keyboard, and a lack of software also didn't help to make it a commercial success. The Amstrad CPC-464 was one of the best-selling computers in Europe, with over 2 million units sold. It had an aggressive market price, which included the monitor, 64K of RAM, which was still very good in early 1984, a built-in tape drive, and a very decent display and sound for the money. Software publishers soon followed, and the CPC quickly became popular for gaming and home office computing. The IBM PC Junior was intended as a low-cost variant of the IBM PC to compete with popular home computers such as the Apple II and C64. Its hardware capabilities were better suited for video games, with a 320x216 color display and a three-voice sound system, but it was not fully compatible with all existing IBM PC software and had technical problems, such as a poor keyboard and a lack of expansion slots. The Apple IIc was the fourth model in the Apple II series. It was a portable, notebook-sized version of the Apple IIe, with a built-in keyboard and floppy disk drive, a powerful 128K of RAM, but a slow 1 MHz processor. It could have a monochrome 9-inch CRT or 7-inch LCD display, but the latter didn't meet expectations and was indeed terrible. The IIc was a closed system, as opposed to the very expandable IIe, but it was still popular with 800,000 units produced. The Auric Atmos was a more powerful successor to the Auric One and featured a full travel keyboard, a better sound chip, and support for higher resolutions. The Atmos was not a beast of a system but offered a decent performance at a bargain price. However, even in this domain, it was largely outclassed by the much more popular ZX Spectrum and the soon-to-come low-end Commodore 16 and Plus 4. 
The MSX was a standardized home computer architecture announced in 1983 and jointly marketed by Microsoft and ASCII from Japan. It was largely based on the Spectra Video SV328 technical features. The MSX standard defined the hardware and software specifications for compatible machines for any given manufacturer. The MSX was popular in Asia, Europe, and South America. It spawned a large library of games and software. The Ishika YC64 featured here is a representative of the MSX standard because of its adherence to common specification and 64K of RAM. The Commodore 16 was an entry-level computer intended to replace the VIC-20 and was priced at $99 to compete with other sub-$100 computers. The C16 had only 16K of RAM and a 1 MHz processor, but the system was designed around the new TED chip which included video and sound functionality. It could handle 128 colors on screen using luminance levels. While not as successful as the Commodore 64, the 16 still sold around 1 million units. The Commodore Plus 4 shared the same basic architecture as the lower-end Commodore 16 and was compatible with its software and peripherals. The Plus 4 name refers to the four Office Suite applications that it had in ROM, but the Plus 4 was incompatible with the C64 and was aimed at the business-oriented personal computer market. By 1984, however, most of these customers were beginning to switch to the new low-cost IBM PC compatibles. The IBM PC-AT, also known as the 5170, was the 16-bit successor to the PC-XT and was powered by the Intel 8286 processor. The PC-AT bus, later known as the ISA bus, could address up to 16 megabytes of RAM, and it supported a 1.2 megabyte floppy drive along with a 20 megabyte hard disk. Its keyboard layout was the precursor to the modern layout we know. The PC-AT was a popular choice for businesses and professionals, and it helped to solidify IBM's dominance in the personal computer market. The Electronica BK is a series of 16-bit PDP-11 compatible home computers developed in the Soviet Union. They were the only official government-approved Soviet home computer design in production. They sold for about 600 rubles, which was costly but marginally affordable as the average Soviet monthly wage then was about 150 rubles. They became one of the most popular home computer models in the USSR. The French Thompson T0770 was an upgraded version of the 1982 T07. With more memory and a mechanical keyboard instead of the awful rubber one of its predecessor, the T0770 was widely used in France under the government educational policy. You could find it in every school back then. It was also marketed as a home and semi-professional computer. It is considered a cult classic by French retro computer nostalgics. The Thompson M05 was released at the same time as the T0770, to which it was basically a lower-end, less expensive version with slightly less RAM and peripherals. It was designed to compete with other popular 8-bit home computers of the time, such as the Spectrum NC64. It was not as successful as them as a home computer, but remained a popular choice in schools where it could be connected in a network. The Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus was an improved version of the original ZX Spectrum, with 48K of RAM, a new QL-style keyboard instead of the Spectrum's rubber one, a reset button, a revised ROM, and a tape interface. Just like its big brother, it soon became popular in Europe for gaming, programming, and other applications. The Tandy 1000 was one of the first IBM PC clones to be released, and the first in a line produced by Tandy for sale in its Radio Shack chain of stores. Less expensive than a comparably equipped IBM PC, it had specific features like graphics, sound, and joystick port, making it more appealing for home use, and some of them became so popular that Tandy was often listed as a standard along with IBM during the 1980s. Until its withdrawal from the PC market, this line of computers saw about a dozen different models and variants. The C128 was the last 8-bit machine released by Commodore. It was a significant upgrade over the C64 with nearly full compatibility. Under a completely redesigned case and keyboard, there was 128K of RAM and a complex architecture with four different kinds of memory. In addition to its MOS processor, there was also a Zilog Z80 which allowed the C128 to run CPM programs and gave it one of the broadest ranges of available software among its competitors. 
After the successful release of the original Amstrad CPC, the 464, consumers were constantly asking for two improvements, more memory and an internal disk drive. The Amstrad CPC 664 addressed the latter demand by featuring an internal 3-inch floppy disk drive, but still had 64K of RAM. It was soon replaced by the CPC 6128, which covered both consumer requests with an increased memory. The Philips VG8020 was the first MSX computer made by the Dutch manufacturer, after the unsuccessful VG8000. This model was more successful and became one of the most popular MSX computers in Europe. It had a real keyboard and the usual features of the MSX standard, including a Zilog Z80 processor at 3.5 MHz, 64K of main RAM, 16K of video RAM, and two cartridge slots. The Atari ST was a 16-32-bit system, hence its name S for 16 and T for 32, based on the powerful Motorola 68000 processor with 512K of RAM and expandable up to 4 megabytes. It was the first personal computer to feature a color graphical user interface called GEM and standard MIDI ports which made a unique machine for music production. The ST also became popular for its large choice of games and business applications. It was sometimes viewed as a color Macintosh that could offer more than Apple for less money. The Amiga 1000 was a 16-32-bit system by Commodore, the first of a successful and legendary line. It was one of the most advanced computers of its time with superior graphics and sound. It could display 32 on-screen colors in standard and up to 4096 in ham mode. It boasted stereo 4-channel sound and offered multitasking capabilities. It was retrospectively seen by the critic as, quote, the first multimedia computer far ahead of its time, end quote. It not only used, but also created many classic games and software. The Amstrad CPC 6128 had 128K of RAM, a long expected improvement by original CPC users. It had the same internal 3 inch floppy disk drive as the previous model, the 664, but the rest it was similar to the original 464 with its Zilog 4 MHz processor, its 16 color 160x200 resolution, and 3 voice sound. With its wide range of software available, the CPC 6128 was a popular computer in Europe and the only model to be sold in the United States. The Amstrad PCW was targeted at the home office market. It quickly became popular in the UK and in Europe due to its affordable price, which included the printer and its easy-to-use interface. The PCW8256 came with 256K of RAM and a monochrome monitor, a 3-inch floppy disk drive, and a variety of software. Though it was designed as a word processor, it could also be used for other applications and even games. The PCW line produced subsequent models over a full decade. The Atari 130XE was an enhanced version of the Atari 8-bit line. The XE retained compatibility with the XL and earlier Atari peripherals and software, thus maintaining its strong gaming library. It featured 128K of RAM, a significant upgrade over its predecessors, allowing for improved capabilities. Its sleek design and keyboard appealed to both gamers and home computer enthusiasts. It resembled a smaller version of the Atari ST, which well summed it up. The MSX2 computer standard introduced in 1985 represented a significant advancement over the MSX1 with a minimum requirement of 64K of RAM as compared to the minimum 8K required previously, enhanced graphics, better audio, and advanced storage options like 3.5-inch floppy disks. It also introduced hardware scrolling and sprite handling, allowing for smoother gameplay. The Yamaha MSX2 featured here was a powerful music machine with an FM sound synthesizer. The Apple Macintosh Plus was a significant improvement over its predecessors. It had a faster processor, the Motorola 68000, running at 8 MHz, more memory, 1 MB expandable to 4 MB, and a built-in SCSI port, which allowed it to connect to external devices such as hard drives and scanners. It also had a new, more compact case design and included a numeric keypad as well as directional keys. The ZX Spectrum Plus 2 was released by Amstrad shortly after the purchase of the Sinclair brand. It was a revision of the ZX Spectrum 128 with a built-in cassette recorder and dual joystick ports. The Plus 2 was also compatible with all Spectrum software and it continued the success of the Spectrum family in European countries and beyond. 
The Auric Telestrat combined elements of the Auric 1 and Atmos models, but its most interesting feature was a built-in modem, since it was designed to integrate with a French Minitel telecommunication system which allowed users to engage in online activities like email, browsing, and gaming, setting it apart from its contemporaries, but it was overpriced and underpowered, which prevented any potential success. The Atari 1040 ST had double the RAM of the 520 ST and became the first home computer with a cost per kilobyte of less than $1. Unlike the first version of the 520, the 1040 ST came with a power supply and double-sided floppy disk drive instead of external. It continued to feature the MIDI interface so popular among musicians and was also used for desktop publishing. The Amstrad PC-1512 featured an Intel 8086 processor at 8 MHz, 512K of RAM, and a 360K floppy disk drive, which already was quite a good configuration for its era. In addition, it came bundled with a GEM graphical user interface and a mouse, which was less than usual for an IBM PC clone. But its real asset was its affordability. At the equivalent of $1,000 in its base version, it was accessible to a wide audience and became the top-selling PC compatible in Europe. The Apple II GS was the most powerful member of the Apple II family. Combining familiar architecture with advanced technology, it featured a 16-bit processor, greatly enhanced graphics and sound capabilities, hence the GS in the name, a color graphical user interface, a wavetable sound synthesis chip, and backward compatibility. Although it didn't achieve the same popularity as the Macintosh, the II GS marked a pivotal transition in Apple's product line, bridging the gap between old and new technologies. The Commodore 64C was an updated version of the iconic C64, introduced four years after the C64's initial release. It retained the C64's beloved 8-bit architecture, but came in a more modern and sleek case design. The C in its name stood for Cost Reduced, indicating manufacturing optimizations with some chips redesigned. These subtle upgrades made the Commodore 64C a refined and user-friendly iteration of the classic C64, and rekindled its legacy in the 1980s home computer market. The Amiga 500 was another groundbreaking machine by Commodore. Smaller and more affordable than the Amiga 1000, it brought cutting-edge technology to a broader audience, with a compact all-in-one design that integrated the keyboard, a user-friendly interface, and a wider range of expansion possibilities. The Amiga 500 offered a richer multimedia experience and became a gaming powerhouse with a vast library of titles. It sold over 3 million units worldwide and joined the club of the most legendary computers. The Amiga 2000, released at about the same time as the 500, introduced several key improvements over the Amiga 1000. It featured an upgradable CPU, enhanced video capabilities, five expansion slots, and a bridge board slot for IBM PC compatibility. This performance and expandability made the Amiga 2000 one of the most advanced computers of its time and a versatile choice for both creative and business applications. The Amstrad PC-1640 boasted several improvements over its predecessor, the 1512. It had 640K of RAM instead of 512, a built-in EGA graphics card which provided better performance than the previous CGA and could be configured with a coprocessor. It also had a larger hard disk capacity. Just like the PC-1512, the 1640 was very successful in the European market, but not in the US. The IBM PS2 was a groundbreaking personal computer series that aimed to set new standards for compatibility and performance. It featured the proprietary microchannel architecture for expansion slots, intended to replace the industry standard ISA, the PS2 port for mice and keyboards, 3.5-inch floppy disk drive, and VGA graphics. Setting new industry benchmarks, the PS2 three initial models using the Intel 8086, 286, and 386 processors were later made available in many many different configurations. The Apple Mac II marked a significant milestone in the Macintosh line. It departed from the all-in-one design of its predecessors and offered previously unseen performance and expandability. Powdered by Motorola's 16MHz 68020 CPU, it featured a 256 color display, a hard disk drive, a standard configuration, and no less than six expansion slots. This flexibility and performance made it a favorite among professionals. The Mac II's influence extended beyond its era, shaping the direction of Apple's desktop computing for years to come. 
Building on the success of its ST line as a family home computer, Atari aimed to reach the business segment with the Mega ST. This machine took on a more professional design with a better quality keyboard separated from the central unit, which in turn could support the weight of the monitor, and contained an internal bus expansion connector. An optional 20 megabyte hard drive could be added, as well as a laser printer. The Sinclair Spectrum Plus 3 integrated a built-in 3-inch floppy disk drive, which was a significant upgrade over the earlier cassette-based loading, but which was no longer a big deal by 1987 standards. Similarly, 128K of RAM was looking very cheap by this time. The Plus 3 maintained compatibility with previous Spectrum software, ensuring a vast library of games and applications. The combined sales of all models in the Spectrum family since 1982 reached over 5 million units worldwide and made it one of the most important home computers of the 80s. The Acorn Archimedes marked a significant advance in British computing technology. Powered by the 32-bit ARM architecture, it offered impressive processing power for its time, making it a pioneer in risk-based computing. It had a powerful graphical user interface and real multitasking capabilities that made use of its high-resolution 256 colors and 8 sound channels. The Archimedes was used for a variety of purposes, including education, business, and gaming. Only sold in Japan, the Sharp X68000 had powerful hardware and software capabilities. It boasted impressive graphics and sound for its time, rivaling arcade gaming machines with 65K on-screen colors and 10 sound channels. Its advanced GUI made it versatile for both games and productivity. The X68000 gained a cult following in Japan with an exclusive library of games and applications, a similar situation to that of the MSX. 3 years after its highly successful first PC, Amstrad launched its second generation, the PC2000 series. It featured a redesigned plastic case, a VGA output, a 3.5 inch floppy drive, and 1 megabyte of RAM in standard configuration. But the most notable improvement was the use of Intel 286 processors, a major upgrade for better performance. The 2000 line allowed Amstrad to remain a major player in the European PC market. The Iskra 1030 DVK was a Soviet 8086 compatible personal computer based on the IBM PCAT. It had a 16 MHz variant of the Intel processor, 640K of RAM, and a 5.25 inch floppy drive. Relatively affordable, it was used for a variety of purposes, including business, education, and home computing. The Iskra was not as popular as some other Soviet made computers, such as the Electronica, but it was still a significant achievement for the Soviet computer industry. The Acorn Archimedes 3000 was an upgrade over the already powerful 300 with an even faster ARM2 processor and support for up to 8 megabytes of RAM, an enormous amount at that time. Unlike the previous models, the 3000 came in a single part case just like the BBC Micro, Amiga 500, and Atari ST, with a keyboard and disk drive integrated into a base unit. Its OS and GUI were far superior to any other personal computer, but it was already too late for another proprietary technology, as IBM compatibles were on the rise. In late 1989, Atari released the 520 and 1040 STE, the enhanced version of the ST line with multimedia improvements. The STE looked like a standard ST, except for new RCA type jacks which allowed stereo sound. It featured PCM audio, an increased color palette to 4096 colors from the ST's 512, though the maximum on screen colors was still limited to 16. A Blitter Co processor, and more easily upgradable RAM using SIM format. And finally, we're going into the 90s, which marked the end of the golden age and the advent of new computer standards that would last for good and continue into modern days. The IBM PS1 was a new line of compact personal computers designed for home users and sold in consumer electronic stores alongside Compaq, HP, and others. The PS1 featured a sleek all-in-one design with a built-in monitor making it space efficient. It was powered by Intel 286 and later 386 processors, and ran MS-DOS and Windows, making it compatible with a wide range of software. User-friendly and affordable, the PS1 was eventually overshadowed in the ever-growing jungle of PC clones. 
The Apple Macintosh Classic was a pivotal computer model in Apple's history since it was the first Mac to sell for less than $1,000. Otherwise, it remained classic with its Motorola 68000 8MHz, 1MB of RAM, 9-inch monochrome display, and a single floppy disk drive. It could have an optional 40MB hard drive. The Macintosh Classic made quality computers accessible to a broader audience with its affordable price tag and played a significant role in establishing Apple's reputation for user-friendly computers. Introduced alongside the Classic, the Macintosh LC also aimed to make Apple Macintosh computing more affordable and accessible. Powered by a 16 MHz Motorola 68020 processor and 10 to 2 MB of RAM, it offered decent performance for its time. The LC could support a color display similar to SVGA, with 256 on-screen colors in high resolution. The LC's affordability and compact design made it popular in homes, schools, and small offices, selling over 1 million units. Aimed at professional users, the Atari TT featured a powerful Motorola 68030 processor at 32 MHz, up to 4 MB of RAM, high-resolution VGA graphics display, and SCSI interface. With its expandable hardware options, it was suitable for desktop publishing, CAD, and scientific applications. The TT was a powerful machine with a lot of potential, but despite its technical prowess, it met little commercial success. Released exclusively in Japan, the Turbo R was the last generation of MSX computers and the only one to use a 16-bit CPU, the RISC R800. The Turbo R had much improved graphics and sound capabilities as compared to previous MSX computers while offering full backward compatibility. Unfortunately, it was largely too late for the MSX standard and the Turbo R was not a commercial success even in Japan. The Atari Falcon represented a significant leap in Atari's line of personal computers, featuring a 32-bit Motorola 68030 processor alongside superior graphics and sound capabilities, including a 65K color display and the innovative DSP for audio processing. But despite its technical advancements, the Falcon was too late in a highly competitive computer market and was discontinued less than a year after its release, marking the end of Atari's computer division but leaving a lasting legacy in the world of vintage computing. The Amiga 600 was a compact and affordable machine that gained popularity among Commodore fans. It was a redesign of the Amiga 500 Plus into a more compact case. With 1 to 2 megabytes of RAM, it offered decent multimedia capabilities for its time. It supported a vast library of games and creative software, thanks to its advanced graphics and sound capabilities. Designed as a successor to the Amiga 500 and 600, the Amiga 1200 featured a more powerful processor, much more RAM, and improved graphics. It offered impressive multimedia performance for its time and was notable for its expandability, with a PC-MCIA slot for hardware upgrades and an IDE interface for easy hard drive installation. The Amiga 1200 was well received by critics and users and lasted until Commodore ended its business four years later. Just like the Amiga 500, the 1200 left a lasting legacy as a legendary and beloved machine. This is the end of our computer saga, from the dawn of this new industry to its coming of age. Despite efforts to make it accurate and many careful reviews, it's possible that our timeline still contains some inaccuracies. Feel free to mention them in the comments. Since many people have asked in social media, the big picture you see here is available as a high-resolution digital download, and there's also an ongoing poster print project. See the comments section for details. See you soon for another Retro Dream.